What's up guys, Benson here and welcome to my channel. Okay, so today I want to talk about a quantum computing application in the materials research and development. And before we dive in, I want to introduce this video is divided into three parts and you can feel free to jump to a specific section by using the timestamp on the progress bar and let's get into it. Every year, same notch, same bezel. The biggest change to me is the ugly camera. I don't know what you feel, but to me, uh, I'm really tired of these iterative smartphones every year because no matter how you're gonna change it, make it foldable or give it better display or even embed uh, faster chips, it's just a phone, nothing too fancy. But we cannot deny the release of iPhone totally changed the way we interact with each other and was one of the uh, most successful innovations in human history. So, as the phones won't renovate too much from now, people have dedicated their efforts into building something else like the smart glasses. For customers, the smart glasses that they want to buy should look something like this. For the next Tony Stark, I trust you. Say, Edith. Stand by for retinol and biometric scan. Retinol and biometric scan accepted. Unfortunately, the you know the real smart glasses on the market nowadays that you can buy are something like this, this, and this. So what hinders people from building the IMS smart glasses is the materials. For example, the battery in the smart glasses has to be small and powerful enough to drive the entire glasses, and the chip or say the graphic processor has to be small and lightweight. But these are all impossible if we cannot create novel materials. And to be honest, nowadays materials innovation is at a really, really slow pace because I'm a material science student, so I can tell. So probably you're wondering, is there a better solution for materials R&D? The answer is yes. In terms of materials innovation, we have to do research, right? So what pops up in your mind first? Either flask or microscope? Yeah, they are super important and essential in experiment, but simply by doing experiment is way not enough because this is like an old fashioned way to do materials research and development. People have been thinking about using computers to simulate this whole process. But how can we simulate this process? Firstly, we have to go down to the microscopic world because all of the matters in our life, including you and me, are composed of smaller building blocks, such as atoms and molecules. And if you finish your high school, you will know that atoms are composed of nuclei and electrons. Say if we want to know whether molecule A and molecule B can react with each other and produce the molecule C that we want, what we have to do is to calculate interactions between nuclei and nuclei, nuclei and electrons, electrons and electrons, and add them up. Then we can know the result. But with the classical computer, we can hardly do this. Because these basic particles are governed by quantum mechanics, which means they have some special properties such as atomic orbital and electron spin. For atomic orbital, electrons around nuclei are not fixed on a single location. They show up in a probabilistic way, so we cannot predict the exact location of electrons. We can only predict the area where we can find the electrons. And because the interactions of these particles will change according to the distance between them, so technically we cannot calculate the accurate interactions between the particles. The best a classical computer can do is to approximate the value by using some methods like Hartree Fock and density functional theory, but keep in mind, these are all approximate values. Another property is electron spin. Spin is an inherent property of electron. It's in superposition and can be in all directions. So here's the problem. Since the spin will generate mechanism and the directions of all the spins of electrons can be in any directions. If we want to calculate the interactions between electrons, we have to store all the spin status in classical computer, which is impossible. Because the data will grow exponentially when we simulate bigger size molecules, and is far beyond most powerful supercomputers in the world. But for now, we can only use classical computer to do the material simulation because this is the only choice that we have. It's not good, but it's the only choice. 
uh, it has some drawbacks. For example, if you want to simulate a big molecule, what you can do is wait because it will take weeks or months to finish the calculation. And don't forget, the classic computer is lack of accuracy. So this always happens. Uh, say if you want to simulate a molecule, you waited for a month, and then when the result came up, it's all bullshit. Actually, this problem was noticed 40 years ago. And physicist Richard Feynman, who was one of the pioneers of quantum computer, once said, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And by goalie, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And he's pretty damn right because building a quantum computer is really, really hard. And that is why we only have some baby quantum computers out there on which we can do very limited things. But we still have to admit that quantum computer is so far the most prominent way that we can simulate the microscopic system and to develop new materials. Okay, as I mentioned before, uh, the spin of electrons is at the superposition state. If you've watched this video before, or if you have some basic knowledge about quantum computers, you will notice that this is also the property that quantum computer has, the superposition. And that is why we can model the quantum behavior protocols like electrons by using a quantum computer, because they're the same. Google simulated a chemical reaction on its quantum computer last year. Basically, diazine has two isomers, cis-diazine and trans-diazine. The only difference of these two isomers is the orientation of the hydrogen atom. So they simulate the process of converting cis-diazine to trans-diazine. There are two ways to do this. The first one is to rotate the hydrogen atom in plane. Another one is to rotate it out of plane. And the energy change differently if we rotate in a different way. This whole process, including the energy, was calculated by quantum computer. Actually, this is a very simple simulation, and we can also get the same result and the same speed from classical computer. IBM also did a simulation on this quantum computer earlier in 2017. They successfully computed the lowest energy states of small molecules like lithium hydride and beryllium hydride. So why they compute the lowest energy state? Because the lowest energy state is the most stable energy state that can determine the structure of molecules and how we interact with other molecules. Their approach is very different from Google's. They totally abandon classical method and use a new one, the quantum method, which is by mapping the electronic structure of molecule orbitals onto qubits. And they reported in a recent blog that they can speed up this process from 45 days to 9 hours. Because this is direct mapping, so it can do simply simulations of even larger molecules and pave the way for future more powerful quantum computers. These two applications from IBM and Google show very simple use cases that because they can be achieved variously by nowadays classical computers. But the objective of building a quantum computer is because we can use it to do something that a classical computer can never do, right? Are we missing the point? No, because uh, the quantum computers for nowadays are very baby and there are not enough qubits, not enough corrective mechanism. You don't have to know what is correct mechanism. I will introduce in my later videos. Uh, There's just something that you can make usable quantum computer. Probably after several years, we can have a quantum computer with thousands of qubits and the error-free mechanism to correct all the errors within the computer. And then we can start to develop new method to, you know, to boost up the materials development and research process. And I look forward to that day. That's pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching and catch you guys in my next one. Peace.